everybody. Books and Brews podcast. Today we are back with some great drinks and a great book. Um, Brian, what, what are we drinking today? We are drinking the pink elephant from the movie Dumbo. You know when he <laughs> gets drunk and he has that, that vision, that dream? That's right, what this is. Right, no, this is uh, This explodes on camera. I always want a little pop. <laughs> All right, hey. And that Thank light was a thousand dollars. Pass me that glass over here. We'll get get some delirium tremens going. Right. Quick pro tip, guys. Uh, I don't know how much you drink, but you want to pour along the side of the glass to not get too much foam. A little bit of foam is appreciated, kind of like a latte. You don't want to go cappuccino, but just a little bit. Uh, Aaron, pass me your glass, there, sir. We'll All get right. you. Let me get the this tilt. This is on. actually the delirium nocturne, which is the uh, brother or sister beer to delirium tremens which I think it was 2012 or 2013, which voted the best beer in the world. And for the price, I would imagine that it, it really must be. Now I've had the Delirium Tremens before and it is really, really good. And I'd recommend it to anybody, but this is the first time I'm trying, mm -hmm. look, along with these guys, we're trying the Delirium Nocturne. So. Yeah, I think, um, uh, well, cheers guys. Yes, All right, is up. cheers. Boom. Yeah. There you go. I yeah. think the uh, na natural ice was a close second in the world beer competition. The natty ice? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's pretty good. This is a, this is a Belgian beer. Okay. Yeah, it's got a nice, nice rich flavor. Mm -hmm. A lot going on there. A little bit sweet. Right. Can you taste the, uh, it's got a little spices in it. A little spicy on the... Uh, a little coriander maybe. In there. Right. Mm -hmm. A little nutmeg. Some... Kind of has that, um, almost reminds me a little bit of a Hefeweizen. All the Belgian beers right. have that, kind of, they call it a wit beer mm -hmm. style. A, a what beer? Wit, W-H-I-T. Oh, I think yeah. it just means wit. white in their native tongue. Mm. Um, but it sounds, it sounds much cooler right. to say wit. No. Uh, speaking of expensive liquids, today we are reviewing a book <laughs> called Boom by right. Horowitz. This book is all about um, oil and everything associated with that, which really runs the gamut from the fracking type things to the, uh, the, the tar sands, which are not called tar sands. There's a whole lot in this book ranging all the way from Canada all the way back down to the States. Uh, there's so much in this book. It's it's a unique story. Brian, what did you think of this? I guess the oil industry, this story. Give me some thoughts. Well, I, I loved it. I like books that kind of give you an inside glimpse of an industry mm -hmm. or a profession that that the casual observer may not be aware of. So this kind of intimate look at you know not just how we get our oil, but the li you know the living conditions of the people who are delivering our oil, you know, political, like local political, municipal ramifications of how that's extracted. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, what, what did you think of the book? Um, I thought it was well, actually pretty well written. It was like reading a, a news story, mm -hmm. you know, because it was a report on basically the industry up there and how they get this, you know, oil, well, this bitumen out of the uh, tar sands up there. And like you're saying, he talks about so many different topics, how, you know, people live up there, about how the oil is extracted, how, you know, these people are just basically, it's a company town almost. Yeah. It reminds me of one of the old American company towns, like if you've ever seen October Sky mm -hmm. or something like that, one of the towns in Pennsylvania or, That's you know, exactly in the is, Midwest yeah. where these towns sprout up around industrial industries. Mm -hmm. And you know, people basically live to dig all this stuff out of the earth. And I, you know, I really, for all those different reasons, I really liked uh, what I saw. Yeah, it's interesting. I have a friend who just moved back from Colorado that was in the fracking industry in Colorado. And uh, these types of jobs, this book does a good job portraying, you know, who are the types of people that would do this kind of work. It's very dangerous. There's a whole lot of heavy machinery that, you know, with a if someone's not paying attention, you can easily lose a limb. And uh, just one stupid mistake is a career ender. There's a whole right. lot at stake. But on the flip side, with basically a high school education or the majority of it, you can easily be pulling in eighty to a hundred thousand dollars. Now the mm -hmm. downside is you're away from your family for you know six to eight months. You're living in weather that's pretty awful in places that are super remote. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot going on in these towns. They live in these. They call them man camps, which sounds like a Maybe a bar. Um, but <laughs> Which, uh, by the way, so the workers can make eighty to hundred thousand dollars a year. Did you do the math on the strippers from like what they said they make a week? So they're making yeah. up to like hundred and fifty k. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. Is that the yeah? The strippers are making one hundred fifty k. Even right. the bar waitresses were like seventy, I think. Right. Making seventy k. Interesting. You focused in on that. Right. Yeah. Just you know. I like to keep 
focused on the most important part. Right, okay, I can yeah. so. Yeah. So, as you might suspect, these guys are out, you know, laboring in the oil fields and do get an occasional weekend off or what have you. And uh, yeah, they go to the strip clubs. And, you know, the problem with, uh, with these types of folks is they're not exactly, most of them aren't like, I'm looking forward to paying my taxes on time, gonna go home and read my Bible for 20 minutes and, and get an early night's right. sleep. Most of these guys are, they're hard asses. So that's, that's the kind right. of work that attracts them. And so mm -hmm. when they get some time off and they got a whole bunch of cash, that leads to usually drugs, women, booze, fist fights, all that stuff. Oh yeah, they said there's, in the phone book, there's four pages of escort services in the right, phone right. book. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, what I thought the most interesting fact was the fact that it said um, there were 80 some thousand people that were supposed to be in the populace of that area, but there were actually only 44,000 residents, people that actually lived yeah, there. Mm -hmm. So there are like over 40,000 people that come there just to work and pull all this oil, you know, mm -hmm. out of the ground up there. Yeah, what's interesting is they do, the first half of the book kind of takes place in Canada talking about getting the, harvesting the oil there, and then the rest of it's taking that pipeline all the way down to the Gulf, and he kind of zigzags around from Canada to the United States to follow that pipeline. And the, the cultures of the Canadians versus the Americans was kind of funny because we're not terribly different, I don't think. If there's any culture mm -hmm. that's as close to ours, it'd be the Canadians. But they were kind of like, we don't like this. This tears up the land. This is infringing on our land. And the Americans looked at it more as um, half of them were very much said, look, if this pipeline comes through here, that's a lot of jobs. That's right. economy. That's money coming through. That means the roads are going to get fixed. We're going to be able to improve our water system. We're going to be able to improve all these different things. And then some of the Americans said, hey, we don't want anything to do with this. this. If this pipe leaks, that's our groundwater gone. I mean, there's, there's some heavy risk that comes with a pipeline of this magnitude failing. Mm -hmm. um, did you get to the part about the pig? Do you guys read about the pig? The no, go ahead. Wait, so can I say one yeah, other thing yeah. about that? So one of the distinct things that I noticed about the difference in the culture was American culture or, or the American opinions around the pipeline were way more polarized. Mm -hmm. It was like either going to end the earth. There was talk about like this, this is it. This is the last nail in the coffin right. for global warming. Or like this was the last hope of our nations, you know, like mm -hmm. getting fossil fuels and putting people to work and having energy and you know, feeding people and keeping them warm in the winters. Mm -hmm. um, so in America, really, really polarized. And in Canadi uh, Canadian culture, it was a lot more um, reserved and civil. You know, even people who had, like environmentalists had opinions, um, they, would, they would end sentences saying, but um, you know, I think that there might be more to this. You know, you might wanna li listen to you know, the oil executives or, you know, or that's just my opinion on where mm -hmm. this is going. Just way more civil on the Canadian side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, you know, it's funny. I guess what, if you guys lived in that area or even maybe for the sake of a hypothetical argument, would you be willing to have a pipe like this run through your backyard if they paid you a, this is just for easy numbers sake, I'll say they paid you $200,000 to have this pipe run through your backyard. You know, I'd be hard pressed to say no, mm -hmm. but I mean, my, my concern, because I'm into environmentalism, mm -hmm. and because they were talking about the gases that would escape from, you know, just dredging it out of the earth just at the location, let alone if there's, you know, a burst pipe somewhere along the line and the yeah. damage that would do, um, you know, I have a, an issue with that, but $200,000 a year, that's kind of hard, to, I gotta be honest with you. It's kind of hard to pass up. I might have to curb my uh, my, my I'll be an environmentalist tomorrow. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> let me sign that contract. You know. um, yeah, I you know I care about the earth a lot. 200k would be hard to pass up. Yeah. But one thing that I felt like um, I don't know if it was the mayor, or city council, the city officials um, up in um, Canada where the bitumen is being extracted. Um, they said, you know, why are you focusing so hard up here on where we're extracting it in the source? Why don't you focus on the demand? Mm -hmm. And and he said, you know, I think it's funny that these celebrities and environmentalists, they're not walking up here. They're flying up in jets <laughs> and driving right. up in cars mm -hmm. right. to speak out against the, the gasoline and the energy that got them up here in the first place. Right, right. You know, it's interesting. I had, a, um, in college, we had a thing where 
people were, uh, we had these real left-wing groups when they were arguing about, you know, no U.S. interest in the Middle East. We need to pull out all of our interests mm -hmm. there. You know, it's evil. Wait, now what, what college did you go to? Well, was at that time, it was at Pasadena City College before oh, okay. I went to Cal State L.A. But there was this group of, uh, what were they called? They were socialists, basically. Mm -hmm. and oh, pinkos. Right, That's pinko what communist pigs, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And they were saying that we should pull out this, that, and the other. And I got up, and it was in the middle of a presentation. There were about 200 people there. Yeah. I was like, how did you get here? <laughs> and the guy who had to admit, you know, well, I drove here. I said, well, when you think about withdrawing from the, the Middle East and all the American interests there, you think again about that because you're going to be on your bike coming from your house next time you decide to... Uh, you know, think of yeah, doing so something on that. It's level. not that those viewpoints are invalid, but it's just to say that the issue is way more complex than just right. we have to stop extracting um, fossil fuels from yeah. the earth. Right. Well, uh, the only real way we can do that is to come up with either synthetic fuels to replace those, or we're going to have to cut back on our consumption somewhere. You know, it, it's, it's not an easy thing to figure out. Mm -hmm. You know, for most people, I mean, for me, yeah, it's kind of like if I had to sacrifice one thing to make sure everything was better, then I would do what I can. Like the whole drought thing we have going on in California yeah. here, you know, I turn off the water, you know, I don't use excess water when I don't need to, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And I think people, when dealing with a situation like that, when our, the, I mean, these uh, supplies are limited. They're not mm -hmm. infinite. And people don't realize that you know, eventually they will run out. So I think that we do have to try to come up with some source of energy that doesn't require for us to totally take it out of the mm -hmm. earth, something so that can, you know. You know. Speaking of the water thing, down in San Diego, they're putting the finishing touches, they've been working on this for I think a decade, on a mm -hmm. desalinization plant in Carlsbad. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, it, it's in one of the inland lagoons just off the ocean. Um, and you know the idea is the ocean is an endless, literally endless supply of water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but those are those are some things that we really haven't explored that much. Um, and uh, you know, as far as energy, you know, we think like uh, everybody's for a smaller carbon footprint. Everybody's for less emissions and stricter standards and stuff, mm -hmm. unless you're the one that has to give something up. You know, like, mm -hmm. yeah, we need, uh, we need to do more solar and wind energy. Uh, but does that mean I have to drive my car less? Or am no. I going to have to pay more for my next car because of all the emission standards that went into creating this? And mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I don't want to pay more at the pump when I fill my car mm -hmm. up yep. for fossil fuels. I just, I want it to be cheaper and I want it to be more environmentally responsible at the same time. And if I have to pick, I'll probably go with cheaper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the, the most people, you know, when it comes down to it, they, just for comparison's sake, the airline industry, I did all these surveys on, you know, what do you want most at an airline? And everyone said, we want more leg room, we want better food, and then it came down to, on, you know, rank these things in percentage, which most important, and the cost always won out. Yeah. And the, this book didn't touch on it, uh, I'm kind of sad it didn't. One of our biggest petroleum demands is plastic. Right. All plastic comes from petroleum, and, mm -hmm. you know, we've got a lot going into the cars, but, uh, Everything we have is, I mean, the amount of things that are plastic that are in your house that are within an arm's reach of you, that it's crazy. I, you know, it's funny. I remember back when we, we were in the kind of second Gulf War and everyone said, this is blood for oil, man. Right. Like, you know, you want cheap gas? This is why. And I went, right. like, gas here costs the same. And, you know, gas needs to come from somewhere. We're still going to have cars mm -hmm. that, that run on gasoline. Electric cars will be there maybe eventually, but <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the electricity is still from coal-powered plants like it's yeah and that's always baffled me and it's all the cars full of plastic and so mm -hmm. you know I I think it's gotten to the point where having a Prius is more of a status symbol than it is you know, about caring about the environment right, you know? because I don't see anybody poor driving a Prius it's always mm -hmm. these stuck up hipster you know just want to be right all the time yeah, now your upper friends that class. watch this show that drive a Prius are gonna Never mind, you don't have any. But what am no, I saying? No, Keep you're going. Right, you're right. No, I do know one person, mm -hmm. and it was because she uses the car for work. 
and so it was practical mm -hmm. for her. But I do remember when they first came out in the 90s, the early 2000s, late 90s, yeah. it was a status symbol for people like Ed Bagley Jr. Mm -hmm. and all these other stars. That, oh, look at me. Look at, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I know Ed Bagley Jr. Sorry about that. But, <laughs> you know, it, it, it just doesn't seem like I know anybody that's like middle to lower middle class that's like running down to Toyota dealerships to get a Prius. Yeah, and I, you know, this book puts an interesting picture on what this environmentalism is and kind of, if you really want, it's, it's great to champion a Prius and maybe complain about why you can't afford one right now, but if you could, you would buy one because I care about the environment that much. And right. when you see that this oil has to come from somewhere and, and getting this oil out of these, they call them tar sands up there, mm -hmm. I, I forget the statistic, we were talking about this before the show, but it was like one barrel of oil comes from... 2,000 pounds of sand? 2,000 tons. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. Was not, it? Not 2,000 tons. I thought it was four tons. Or oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're tons. right. One barrel comes from four tons. Something uh, like that. Yeah. yeah. So 8,000 pounds of sand produces one 55-gallon drum. And they were processing, like, uh, millions of barrels it a was, day yeah, or something? It was, yeah, 80 million? Yeah. I don't know. It was a lot. Millions of barrels a day. So that can, you, you can see how much of the, that sand and earth is mm -hmm. being dredged up every single day yeah and that's you know I, I don't know where you guys are watching this from but in places like southern california here um there public transportation isn't really a viable option it's <laughs> it is there some someone is paying for a bus uh somewhere mm -hmm. you, the, we do have some kind of a subway type system in downtown la but mm -hmm. probably 90 percent of the people need to take a car to get to work we're so spread out here in the, mm -hmm. the la basin it's not it's not practical to, to take a greener way to get to work. Your, your option is you can get a car that runs fuel efficiently, or if you have a big family, like you do, like we're talking the way here, like your car doesn't get the greatest mileage, but it's kind of a little bit of a compromise because you have several kids that you need to drive around too. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I don't even want to say what mileage I get because of all the, the death threats that I'll get. <laughs> well, when you drive an H1, I mean, you can expect this kind of From flat. the hipsters on the Prius. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I think this, is an interesting perspective and um, I don't know I you know I I love to hear people complain about the gas price that always amuses me when they say like you know I I, uh, I want to do more for my family but mm -hmm. um, gas went up 25 cents a gallon and it's like well when gas was down 25 cents a gallon did you mm -hmm. put that away in a piggy bank like right you know if, if it's gonna cost you eight dollars more to fill up your tank there's and that's gonna make or break you there, there's a bigger issue at hand that's not that's not the problem um, and it's just, I, I don't know, I get, I think it's so funny that we're so wrapped up in this oil, yet there's very little as an individual that you can do about it. This is what gas costs, this is what right. you're gonna pay. And, and we're talking about oil in America, the United mm -hmm. States of America, mm -hmm. that is. Um, so, you know, when you look at the global picture, um, we're not the heaviest polluter of the earth. True. Um, there's a lot of other stuff that, that goes yeah. on. Um, one interesting thing that's been happening over the last year, or maybe a couple of years, is solar has really taken off the way that people have thought for years and years that it will. Mm -hmm. and a big reason for that is because solar panels have become really cheap. And the reason that solar panels have become really cheap is because China overproduced solar panels. Um, oh, really? You know, like, you know how China does stuff. They like, we're gonna do solar until they make like a whole city out of solar mm -hmm. stuff. Right. Um, and so that mass production um, led to like a, a, a huge f um, downfall in the cost of production of solar panels. Mm. Um, so solar has become really, really cheap, mm -hmm. but it's only become cheap because China overproduced. And if we look at China and how they're producing solar panels and how they're producing energy and everything, they're producing that stuff terribly with, you know, lots of bad chemicals, coal burning factories. Right. And they have the worst pollution on the planet. Yeah. In their major cities in like Beijing. Yeah. You know, anytime you have to have air scrubbers put into place yeah, just so you can have yeah. the Olympics in your city, you know, that says a lot about what you're doing over there. You know, it's funny that you say that because now that they've started to switch over to, uh, you know, the economic hotspots moving away from the centralized economies and all that kind of stuff. People are I have able no to. No idea what you're talking about. Okay, my <laughs> point is. Did you just throw this. out some some fancy words to <laughs> right. impress me? I read it in re Reader's Digest. Yeah. <laughs> no. The the point is this: is that now that Wait, people no, are. What, please explain what you said. The economic hotspots. Okay, there are cities like Shanghai that are in China that were slowly opened up 
to a more westernized economy mm -hmm. okay. to be put, you know, to uh, work in the capitalist markets to trade and all that kind of stuff instead of working in a centralized economy, which is planned by the government and only okay. utilized within the borders itself. Okay, do you okay. understand what I'm okay. saying? Thank you. Before okay. we get too deep into right. economics 101, <laughs> but uh, there was we're a point almost where out of I time. I say, okay. wrapping this up, is this a story you think people should hear? I do. I think it was a very well written, very well researched story. The author actually went to the location. He didn't just utilize a lot of, you know, library materials and call people over the phone and that kind of stuff. He actually went to these locations and put himself in harm's way to get to these sites where they were digging at. Mm -hmm. And he, the, well, the research was very well done and the information, as far as I've seen, has been very accurate. So I would, for anybody who wanted to, I would definitely read this. Yeah, Brian, what do you think? This yeah, short book, it's one of those Kindle, I, I'm on the, what, what's the Kindle thing that where you, you can Oh, it's read? the Unlimited plan. Kindle Unlimited, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I'm on that, I think it's $10 a month, so I didn't have to pay anything. Mm -hmm. Short book, yeah, definitely, good read. Yeah, I, th I think you guys will enjoy this, uh, especially because it gives a, a pretty non-biased approach to this thing. You know, this is such, as you were saying earlier, this is such a polarizing issue of this is absolutely the best thing for the environment and economy, or this is the worst thing for the environment and it's going to ruin our economy. And I think this book does a good job of interviewing real people, looking at their situations and how this is going to impact them and, you know, ultimately how it's going to impact us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, check us out. We'll put some links in the show notes, but I, I think you guys will dig this. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back very soon with more great episodes.